Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Sipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Schiffman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. Let's celebrate our winter holiday edition of Horse Center with that opening day card at Santa Anita. Yeah, Matt. Merry Christmas to all of you. Uh, great year. 2021 we hope that uh, 2022 will be even better for you but as matt mentioned what a day of racing the day after christmas of course it's opening day it's santa anita matt there's three grade ones three grade twos sprinkled throughout the card uh three really nice turf races in the american oaks the san gabriel and the mathis mile but we're going to concentrate on the dirt we think that's where the uh most interesting races are and uh, maybe the most uh, well-known horses. So Matt and I are going to start with the grade one Malibu, Matt. It's 300,000. It's grade one. This has become just a very good race year to year. And uh, it looks like we have a most interesting matchup in the big two, Matt. Yes, yeah, certainly do. Seven furlongs, which is always an interesting sp uh, sprint distance. That extra furlong uh, makes things interesting. But we've got uh, uh, a veteran, more of a veteran, and Dr. Shival meeting up with uh, the speedy flight line who will be making only his third start. Yeah, yeah. It's a matchup we've actually been waiting for for a while, and we get it here in the seven furlong Malibu. Matt, we're going to start with the whole field. We're going to start on the rail. Baby Yoda comes from the East Coast for trainer Bill Mott. And uh, this horse, after uh, really running, to, I guess his buyer was one of the highest buyers of the year when he won that allowance, his second win at Saratoga this summer, Matt. But in two stakes races, he's kind of had uh, some rough trips and, and was pretty well beaten in both. Does Baby Yoda have a shot to come out here and surprise? I don't know, Brian. It's a pretty tough spot, like you said. Made a big splash at uh, Saratoga, and that in that speed figure had uh, people talking. But he, he ran third in the Vosburg, which was okay, and then went out and, like you said, had a rough trip in uh, in a big sprint race out at Mahoning Valley. Uh, certainly a tough spot when you're talking about traveling all, all the way across the country, also. Yeah, I will say this about Baby Yoda. I think he, he's better than his last two starts. He did have trouble in both of those starts, including the third in the Vosper. I think the distance of seven furlong suits, I also think his running style might be good for this kind of race as well. Seven furlongs with some speed. So he, he would be at least a long shot I consider in here. I can't say the same about the number two, Matt. Timeless bounty, though. I mean, I think, I think they have to be happy with uh, uh, what they already got in 2021 for the Michigan bread. Yeah, I would say so too, Brian, particularly uh, considering that this horse was claimed for $15,000 back in uh, October and, and got a nice win uh, uh, in a stakes race. So yeah, they should be happy, but boy, uh, uh, this is a tough spot, or super tough spot for trainer Bob Hess. Yeah, I think it's too tough a spot for Timeless Bounty, but uh, hey, that Steel Valley Sprint is a rich sprint. So for him to win that at nearly 60 to 1, that, that was an accomplishment. They're taking another shot, but I think it's too much. The three mat is Stiletto Boy. Stiletto Boy is a very interesting horse. Uh, you'll see that we have him at 10 to 1 on our morning line. Stiletto Boy, I, I don't think we'll get that much in the Malibu, but the company he's been keeping, Matt, ever since winning the Iowa Derby has been absolutely excellent. Yeah, really good company. Uh, was fifth in the Breeders' Cup Classic. That's pretty darn good, Brian. Uh, when, when you think about that field and you think about the top four that he ran behind in there. And then before that, he was second in the awesome again behind Medina Spirit. So those, those are a couple of awfully darn good uh, performances, but now cutting back to uh, the seven furlong distance. Yeah, and, and like I said with Baby Yoda, I think there is some uh, reason to believe horses will be rallying in this seven for a long sprint with speed. So Stiletto Boy fits the bill for me. Actually, I like him better than Baby Yoda. I think he'll be, be bet below Baby Yoda, but still, I, I think he'll have great odds in here. He's run three straight times against Medina Spirit. He wasn't embarrassed in any. He's beaten good horses. Uh, you know, he was fifth. He was second. Uh, he was third, but he's been ahead of good horses in all those races. So I think he's a horse who's going to pick up some pieces and actually think he's got a real good shot to get in the triple on Sunday. 
the four is one of the big horses, Matt. We have them nine to five. I've even seen some other handicappers have them even higher. And that kind of blows my mind if he's if he's three to one or something. But Dr. Scheibel just been a terrific sprinter. He ran third and second in his first two races of his life. Ever since then, he's been awesome. He's kind of unlucky to not have a six race winning streak coming into this. I think he's on the verge of winning the Eclipse Award if he wins this race, Matt. Tough loss last time in the Breeders' Cup sprint. Yeah, I agree, Brian. That and they're taking their shot in here. That's one of the things that's intriguing about the Malibu sometimes, and then certainly this year the the Eclipse Award uh, ramifications with second, like as you said, in that Breeders' Cup sprint, just getting run down by Aloha West, uh, uh, nearing the wire. And as you said, Brian uh, uh, had five wins in a row heading into the Breeders' Cup. I, I like his versatility. Uh, he won the 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 Crosby uh, with a closing trip, at, but then won the Santa Anita. Uh, sprint uh, more with a front running effort. So I like the versatility clearly in here. He's not going to want to be running early and knocking heads. I, I don't know. You know, he, he's got to deal with uh, a flight line who we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, who is super speedy. Um, I mean, he can't let that one get too far ahead, but it, it's going to be interesting. Certainly has the back class uh in this field yeah and i wouldn't even say back class matt just just call it class he's a two-time grade one winner but i think his last two races might be his best two races don't forget in that race over the santa anita main track where the malibu will be he ran a huge race because he wasn't going to the lead until until the irons broke on his uh, uh for his uh, jockey in that race and uh, dr shiloh uh, zoomed up to the lead there and, and dominated at Santa Anita. We know he likes the track. He's won at seven furlongs. I don't think seven furlongs is a problem at all for Dr. Scheibel. Remember, he had to take the race to Jackie's Warrior last time. He chased extremely fast fractions that ultimately sizzled and, and fizzled uh, Jackie's Warrior in the Breeders' Cup sprint. So Dr. Scheibel did the dirty work and took over that race only to get past late because he was a little tired after doing all that dirty work. I thought he was the best horse in the Breeders' Cup sprint got a big advantage over flight line as far as uh, experience and, and what he's already been through. So I, I actually think Dr. Scheibel is the horse to beat, Matt, but we need to talk about flight line, the number five horse in here. We have missed the seven, five morning line favorite. I have pretty much no doubt that he will be favorite. That's how much talk he's gotten over his first two races. They're spread out, Matt. I've people, I have seen people compare him to Hidden Scroll, and I and I and I just don't see it because if you watch Flightline run, you know he is a very, very talented horse. I don't think he's a sprinter either. I think he's going to get better as distances increase. I just think this is a really tough spot for Flightline's third career race and only his second race uh, in, in several months. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree with that, and you know, I I understand people saying you know citing Hidden Scroll. But there are other horses recently. You might look at Baby Yoda and as other people and uh, horses that have thrown in tremendously impressive performances um, and then fizzled out as they've gotten into stakes company. I understand uh, people grabbing onto that, but let's you know take a look at those two races by flight line. They were they were almost identical, Brian, with very very fast fractions going six furlongs, uh, uh, upper twenty one, close to twenty two, then forty four, then fifty six for five furlongs, and then and ending those races in 108 and 108 and change both times winning by approximately 13 lengths one time at santa anita for the maiden second time at del mar um yeah uh what maybe concerns me more than him being a flash in the pan is as you mentioned brian the amount of time that has come between races yeah, yeah, he he debuted uh, way back uh, in, in early spring, Matt. So his races have been really spread out, which makes you wonder how how healthy he is. I know they think they have something special. I think they have something special. Uh, the way he uh, runs, the way he works out, you could just see a fluidity of motion and ease of the way he's running very, very fast. So I think he is a special horse. He'll be a special horse only if he can stay healthy and, and put together a uh, campaign as a four-year-old. 
tough spot though because Dr. Scheibel is a serious sprinter and a, and a horse I think is going to be the sprint champion if he wins this race. The sixth horse, Matt, is Team Merchants. Uh, this is a son of Nyquist. Uh, he, he's a stakes winner on turf. Uh, he doesn't look quite as good as the best in here. Do you, do you like this one at all? No, I don't, Brian. Uh, you know, that stakes win was in a restricted uh a restricted race. Um, so, uh, no, I'm not gonna, I, I think this one is, at, as you uh, talked about, an uh, intriguing, me intriguing meeting between Dr. Scheivel and Flightline with, with the chance of uh, one of the closers that we mentioned, uh, uh, possibly uh, getting into the trifecta or maybe uh, uh, getting into second. Yeah, it's Team Merchants, I, I think, is actually a horse who probably will like this seven furlong trip. Uh, I think he's got a turn of foot in here, but uh, it just looks a little bit too tough for me as well. So I'm going to agree with you. We haven't talked about the seven at all, Matt, and maybe we should be talking about the seven. This is a son of Toppet, like Flightline. He's a son of Toppet, but he's out of uh, the, the dam of American Pharaoh. So he literally could not be any better bred Matt, and he's looked good winning his first two starts why are we talking all about flight line and not about triple tap uh, I, we got to talk about triple tap as you as you mentioned uh uh you know a half brother to american pharaoh uh two victories two starts maiden special mate win at santa anita in March, followed by a, a more recent allowance win at Del Mar. So, that, you know, there's a little bit of a similarity between the PPs of Triple Tap and Flightline in terms of uh, the dates of their star, uh, their starts and the, uh, you know, and the results in terms of two wins from two starts. But, you know, those wins were not in the same kind of atmosphere as Flightline flew in. Yeah, I, I like how you put that, Matt. It, it, it's a little bit of a different atmosphere. And hey, listen, Triple Top could be a serious horse. He's got the pedigree, trained by Bob Baffert. He's looked very good in his first two. He ran very fast uh, uh, on Breeders' Cup Day there uh, in winning that allowance race. Um, but yeah, if you compare him and the way he looks in his races to flight line, it, there is a difference. And and for that reason, I am quite a bit higher on flight line moving forward. But just like flight line, I think Triple Top is a horse who very well could run two turns and very well could be a force to be reckoned with next year. All right, that's uh, that's our uh, preview of the seven horse field in the in the grade one seven furlong uh, Malibu stakes. Matt, who's your top pick? Brian, you know, as we talked about, I, I, I'm i going to try and beat flight line, you know, no doubt in my mind either that he is going to be a pretty short favorite and, and just the idea that that Dr. Scheidel could possibly be two to one. I, I don't know if I see that. Like you mentioned earlier, some handicappers are saying that two to one, five to two, even three to one. I can't imagine, but still unlikely to be the favorite, likely to be the second choice with all that he's accomplished already and what flight line has to step up to do. I'm going to go with Dr. Scheidel. Yeah, and for all the reasons you just said, I, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. Dr. Scheibel is my top pick in here. I, like I said, I think Flightline is uh, just a super talent, and this should be a very fun race. I'm also going to throw in Stiletto Boy in my trifectas. I think he could get into the picture at pretty good odds. All right, Matt, we're going to stick with the males because, hey, the biggest name running on Sunday at Santa Anita is in one of the grade two races. It's the $200,000 San Antonio, Matt. It's a mile and a sixteenth on the dirt, and it's kind of a bridge between 2021 and Hot Rod Charlie had a very good year in 2021 to 2022. Pointing for the Dubai World Cup in March, this will be the race that bridges the Breeders' Cup Classic to the Dubai World Cup for Hot Rod Charlie. We got him as a very heavy favorite in the San Antonio. Very, very, very heavy favorite, no, uh, no doubt, Brian, and deservedly so. We've talked about Hot Rod Charlie so many times, so many because he's been in so many big races and had so much going on uh, this year. Um, Hot Rod Charlie has been, you know, uh, 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 chugging along, you know, uh, in these days of horses not racing that much. Hot Rod Charlie, relatively speaking, has raced a lot more than most horses. He's 
been running almost every month, every, you know, month, month and a half uh, since he debuted all the way back in July of 2020. And, and, you know, compared to the good old days that Brian and I like to talk about, you know, he's lightly raced, but in today's world, um, he's had a pretty, uh, uh, a pretty consistent and long campaign. And here he comes back after running fourth, uh, in the Breeders' Cup Classic, in that you know, really in that excellent field, um, after winning the Pennsylvania Derby and all the other things uh, that have happened with him, the Haskell, etc., um, uh, he's going to be very, very hard to beat, Brian. Yeah, I, I, I can't disagree with you, Matt. You know, uh, I, you know, I've been on the hot rod Charlie bandwagon for a long time. Yeah, he he would have three three million dollar wins this year if not for the uh the, the disqualification out of that Haskell win for Hot Rod Charlie and I, I think none of those are his best race I think his best race was the Belmont Stakes where he gave essential quality everything he wanted after running uh suicidal maybe suicidal fractions early in that mile and a half Belmont anyway I digress uh, Hot Rod Charlie eighth race this year yeah that's uh that's a uh ambitious campaign considering none of them were easy spots this looks like the easiest spot he'll find all year uh, I, I just think the son of Oxbow is a, is a really terrific horse and he, and he's continues to do well, say what you want about finishing fourth last time, but it was a very good course. Of course, Nick's go Medina spirit, essential quality finished ahead of him. He was right there for second, uh, at the eighth hole and he got out finished a little bit by the two, three-year-olds that will battle it out for an eclipse award. I, I think hot rod Charlie was, uh, a huge part of a wonderful, wonderful three-year-old crop this year. And I do expect to see the Vox Populi, uh, the voice of the people winner, Matt. Uh, let me mention that real quick. I'm on the nominating committee for the Vox Populi, and, and I really like to see a horse who's not going to win an Eclipse Award get the Vox Populi. So I was pleased to see my, my pal Hot Rod Charlie get that award. If there's any horse in the race for me, Matt, who I think has the talent to run a big race and give Hot Rod Charlie, a, if Hot Rod Charlie runs a decent race, to give Hot, Hot Rod Charlie maybe at least something to think about at the eighth hole, it's Express Train. Uh, this is a horse who's won two grade twos this year. Yeah, Express Train. Uh, we, we've we seen him running in a lot of big races out in California for John Sheriffs. He was third in the awesome again. He won the uh, the San Diego Handicap, um, you know, a, a hard knocker. And this looks like he's found a good, uh, a good field. I mean, accepting, you know, having to deal with Hot Rod Charlie. Yeah, and I also like the fact that they decided to skip the Breeders' Cup Classic. He's been off since that awesome again, which was early October. So he's had a, a nice little freshening here. I, I expect him to run the, uh, the best race to give Hot Rod Charlie the most competition. Looking at the rest of the field, you'd have to talk about the uh, Native Diver recently at Delmar. It's the key race because the uh, uh, other big threats, I think, in here ran one, two, three in there. The, the winner was Azel Coast for Bob Dafford. Eight rings was the beaten favorite. And Kiss to Day Goodbye was the rallying horse who who split them to be second in that native diver. Yeah, I cert certainly think that's a race you have to look at in terms of uh, if you want to take a chance to try and beat uh, Hot Rod Charlie at such a short price, or, or if you're looking for the second horse in the exacta, um, you mentioned Kiss Today Goodbye, um, who we have at 10 to 1 on the morning line, uh, ran a really nice closing move in the, to finish second, the native diver off of a layoff, getting blinkers on, and he did win the San Antonio in 2020. He'll be my horse that, um, you know, I guess... I'm going to call him my top choice or, or more like uh, the one that uh, could get into the exacto. All right. Yeah. Kiss to get the kiss today. Goodbye has shown flashes of, of really good performances, yeah. including a year ago winning the San Antonio. He's also thrown in some bad races. Maybe the blinkers, maybe the layoff will help. He ran a decent race last time to get uh, to beat eight rings for second behind Azel Coast. I just don't think any of the three of them are quite at the class of express train among the the older horses that uh, uh, Hot Rod Charlie will be facing here. I think they're a, a, a cut below and, and grade two is pushing it and grade two with Hot Rod Charlie and it is really pushing it for me. So uh, Matt, who's your top pick? I, I think we kind of already know what you're going to say here. Yeah, I'm going to just because of the 
you know, the three to five that we say maybe could even be less than that. Uh, that's just such a short price. Uh, although Hot Rod Charlie is a very, very likely winner. I'm going to take a shot and make Kiss Today Goodbye um, my top choice, hoping that Blinker's on in the layoff and maybe uh, he can uh, uh, step up after that nice performance in the Native Diver. Yeah, this is a race I'm just going to watch. Uh, basically, Matt, I think Hot Rod Charlie is by far the class of the race, and I like Hot Rod Charlie uh, certainly to win this San Antonio on Sunday. Folks, if you haven't yet, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel here at Horse Racing Nation. It helps Matt and I out a lot. We appreciate it. Turn on those notifications so you never miss another episode of Horse Center. I think I said that before. Now we got one more big dirt race. It's another great one. It's at seven furlongs. So it's the female counterpart to the Malibu. It's the La Brea. And while I think the Malibu came up great, I don't think the La Brea is quite as interesting to me, except for maybe from a betting standpoint, certainly private mission is going to be the favorite Matt Shipman. She's coming off a really pretty poor performance in the Breeders' Cup this time. Yeah, man, maybe out of the three races that we're talking about, Brian, uh, th this is the one that's a little bit more wide open, certainly not a, the big uh, headliner names of the other two. But as you said, that that adds up to the fact that this might be a more interesting uh, betting race. But yeah, we got private mission for uh, Mr. Baffert uh, was, yeah, was last. Uh, in the uh, Breeders' Cup distaff last time, but uh, as we remember, was an impressive debut winner, um, and and after that, recorded victories in the Grade Three Tory Pines and in the Grade Two Zenyatta. So uh, uh, there's a lot of potential there that we have seen from Private Mission, and with the with the Baffert name, likely to be the favorite. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure she will be the favorite in here coming out of the, the last, last place finish in the Breeders' Cup Distaff. And, and, you know, it, it's it's not uh, surprising that she folded up her tent early in that race after setting just crazy fractions with Latruska, the likes of Latruska, and she there's the devil breathing down her neck. So, you know, uh, the, the margin that she lost to Distaff, I, I, I think that can be a discouragement to horses coming out of such a race. And as the favorite, the fact that maybe she was discouraged in her last race and had a tough race gives me hope that she can be beaten. Uh, she won the Zenyatta. She won the Tory Pines, two graded races, like Matt said, before the Breeders' Cup this time. She was kind of the, uh, uh, a little bit, she got a little bit of talk going into the Breeders' Cup this time. But I think this is a good spot to beat her. There's other speed in here. Dropping down to seven prolongs off of what I called possibly a discouraging race. I, I think there's reason to beat her. Uh, or to try to beat her as the favorite. And I guess we start with living my best, uh, living my best life. Uh, I, I want to call her living my beast life, Matt, because she's a daughter of the big beast. Yes, and the big beast was quite a sprinter uh, in his own right. Uh, at his best, uh, we remember uh, his big victory in the King's Bishop at uh, uh, in New York, and then several other uh, really good finishes in very competitive uh, sprints. So yeah, uh, I don't know if they, if uh, because of the naming rules, there wasn't room for that last uh, A in there, and they had to go with living my best life. Um, but uh, trained by John Sadler, got a couple of uh, of nice wins. Uh, including a nice speedy front end wind at uh, Los Alamitos. Yeah, she comes in off two stakes wins. Both were front running and she is a front runner. If you look at her past performances, she is on the lead every single time. I think that's a tough spot though. Seven furlongs with other speed because she's got both of the Bafferts who have quite a bit of speed in here. We're going to talk about Calypso in a second. So I actually think living my best life, moving up from those listed stakes that she's been wiring to a seven furlong race in here. I think, I think that's a tough spot, but I think she certainly will factor in early. Calypso probably will too. We haven't seen Calypso since Kentucky Oaks Day when she, uh, uh, she bled and she was eased in the uh, grade two eight bells. She was considered a threat in that grade two eight bells, which is probably a better field than she'll see in the grade one La Brea on Sunday. Calypso is a two-time stakes winner sprinting at Santa Anita, including the seven furlong Santa Inez earlier this year. So 
there's a lot to like about Calypso. If you think that she can come back after eight or nine months off, I guess it's been eight months since Kentucky Oaks Day, uh, uh, fresh and ready for a big performance in here. Yeah, had some great performances heading into that AFLs. And as you mentioned, uh, as the chart said, uh, she bled in that race and, and must have bled pretty badly because uh, she got pulled up in there. And, you know, and people sometimes think bled, uh, just give them some Lasix and, and then they'll be OK. But, you know, uh, bleeding means that there's been stuff going on in their lungs and there can be some residual damage to the tissue of the lungs. And clearly with the amount of time that Calypso has had off, it must have been a pretty uh, significant uh, case of, of bleeding in the horse. But uh, uh, she's back here and uh, obviously with, with the rules is not going to be able to run with Lasix in there. So lots of question marks, but but so much potential in the past. Yeah, Calypso is a nice filly. She's a nice sprinter too. So it makes sense that she's in this field, but uh, lack of Lasix, long layoff. I think she'll be fresh and I think she'll show speed like she does. Uh, fresh horses often, especially if they have speed to begin with, want to show speed in that first race after a long layoff. So the first three to horses we talked about in the La Brea all have a lot of speed. So we're starting to get to see why I, I feel like Somebody can win this race from off the pace, Matt. Uh, Missy P, I think we need to talk about Missy P because she is also a very talented horse. Uh, Richard Mandela, Papa Mandela trains this uh, daughter of Into Mischief and she looked like a really good thing in her debut performance earlier this year, but uh, didn't have quite as much success when she tried stakes racing. Still, she's only had three lifetime races. Yeah, it was a debut uh, at Santa Anita where she won by almost 10 lengths in March. So uh, uh, a, a, a very impressive debut. And as you mentioned, the follow up races weren't quite there and now has been off since June. You know, Richard Mandela will, you know, he, he, he's not one uh, uh, who will hesitate to pull the plug just basically because horse uh, needs a talented horse needs time to mature and develop, you know, I don't quite know the full story uh, uh, about the, you know, the June, the layoff since June, but, uh, you know, if anybody can get a talented horse uh, ready off the bench, Mandela is one of them. Yeah, I agree with that, Matt. Mandela is one of them. And also, you know, he liked her. He, he put her in against males in that Desert Code Stakes on the turf in her third start. Uh, she didn't run poorly in either of those stakes losses. Uh, I think she's clearly a very talented horse. Maybe she needed time to get right again, maybe mature a little bit. I, I think she's a dangerous, dangerous horse in here. She's also fresh, everything I said about Calypso. So it'll be interesting to see if she only adds to the early pace. But I think she's a dangerous horse here as probably the fourth choice or so. Next horse I want to mention, Matt, is Canoodling, because Canoodling I would like. <laughs> she's been running in New Mexico. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I like the name Canoodling, but yeah. she's been running in New Mexico for a while now, and, and people will be quick to dismiss her. I think we'll get some nice odds on Canoodling because she's been running in New Mexico for all these races. But there's some good sprints down in New Mexico, Matt, I want to tell you, and, and Canoodling is just getting better and better. She's got a style where she can sit off the pace a little bit and make a move. I, you know, if this was a nine for a long grade one race or a really strong grade one race, I might feel differently. But those races she's been running, especially recently in New Mexico, the only time she's been beaten recently was by the boys when she tried to stretch out. And even then she wasn't beaten by much. I think seven furlongs with a lot of speed in front of her is a good spot for the Philly coming from New Mexico. I've seen horses do this before. I like canoodling. Call me crazy. Hey, I can't call you crazy. I also love the name. Uh, also, you got to love uh, canoodling. Um, as you said, recent winner of at Zia Park, the Zia Park distaff. And hey, Brian, pace makes the race. And there's a ton of pace in this race for canoodling to run at. And like you said, and, and we've been saying about this race, so many horses that have flashed a lot of talent, but uh Kind of wide open-ish. Kind of wide open-ish, kind of a lot of speed going seven furlongs. I don't love Canoodling's draw on the rail because I'd like to see her sit fourth or fifth early and then pounce as they're straightening out. But uh, hopefully she can get a good trip off the rail and sit behind all that speed. 
One more horse to mention, brilliant cut, Matt. She's had stakes experience. She's run against Calypso. She's coming off a nice win, and she also can come from a little bit off the pace. Yes, uh, trainer Doug O'Neill, who was looking to have a big day on opening day at Santa Anita. This horse was claimed for fifty thousand dollars. Not, uh, you know, not too, uh, not too long ago. Got a nice win at Santa Anita in October. Has a third place finish in the Santa Inez. Um, so uh, certainly uh, one that uh, seems to be moving up the ladder for yeah. Kentucky Derby winning trainer, Doug O'Neill. Sorry, Matt. Yeah, you you certainly can consider her in here, especially if she gets that trip I'm talking about of sitting off the pace. And she wasn't quite as good as Calypso when they were meeting earlier in the year, but a lot has happened since then. She hasn't thrilled me since then, but her last, last race was a nice win. So another one to consider. That's the La Brea, Matt, uh, the female version of the Malibu. Who do you like? Brian, it's it's a tough one, and uh, I'm going to go with uh, living my best life just because I think we're probably going to get some pretty good, relatively speaking, good odds on uh, her. I agree with you, Matt. I, I think maybe my three to one uh, uh, pick there in the morning line is, is a little bit lower than she'll actually be, although she's coming off a couple of stakes wins. I don't agree with your pick, though. I, I'm against her. I know you like the big beast, and I don't blame you for picking her. You know, any one of the six we mentioned probably could win this race. And I'm afraid of private mission uh, on class. And I'm certainly afraid of Miss TP on talent coming from the Mandela Barn. But I like Canoodle. I, th I think this is a good spot to get a long shot winner of the La Brea. And I think she is the long shot for me uh, with all those good sprint performances found in New Mexico. Oh, Matt, that's that's a lot to look forward to. We didn't even talk about the turf races on opening day at Santa Anita. It should be a wonderful day, a race uh, race card that I look forward to. You know, it's one of the, the best, I don't know, six or seven race cards of the year, probably opening day. And it comes right after Christmas. So you probably have a great party shot for us today. Yeah, you know, it's always an interesting card because uh, on the calendar, it it is right. Technically, the last weekend of racing of the year but in a way it kind of feels like kicking off the new year because it's opening day at santa anita so uh, uh stay safe everybody um i wish i didn't have to set, keep saying stay safe with uh all the, with covid in mind i'm a little tired of all that but stay safe enjoy your holidays and we'll see you next week on horse center and of course i want to thank our producer ben wilkie for putting together the show yeah, thanks to Ben. Thanks for all you for watching every week. Thanks to our sponsor, the best contest site out there. That's Derby Wars. Uh, yeah, and if you're at Santa, if you're lucky enough to be at Santa Anita the day after Christmas, then you're uh, you step up to the carving board. Those great sandwiches they have at Santa Anita. Think of that yeah. as you're eating one of those delicious sandwiches. Next week we'll be back on the Derby Trail with a uh, a gaggle of Derby preps around the country. So you have that to look forward to right here on Horse Center. We'll see you then.